So the final lesson on the statistical properties on OLS uh, focuses on the asymptotic properties. And then towards the end, I will also, also briefly summarize the links between the properties and the assumptions required. So in the previous lesson, uh, I walk you through the finite sample properties such as unbiasedness, efficiency, and mean squared error. So in this lesson, then, we turn attention to asymptotic properties, uh, and particularly consistency and asymptotic normality. Uh, an asymptotic word refers to the situation where the sample size approaches to infinity. So in some sense, it's the ideal case that uh, where you can have uh, uh, as, much, as much observations as you possibly could. So, so in some sense, the finite sample doesn't restrict your, your analysis in any way. So let's first turn attention to the consistency. And here it's firstly important to make a distinction between uh, logical, logical consistency of the model. So statistical consistency is, uh, is something completely different than log logical consistency of your, of your model. Of course, like, like uh, you are interested that your, your model doesn't have some kind of logical contradictions, uh, but that's not uh, what the statistical consistency means. So there's very specific meaning to this uh, term statistical consistency. And uh, specifically, I will, I'll again, uh, talk in terms of a single regression model. Beta 2 is the, the true slope coefficient of interest, and B2 is our OLS estimator that we compute based on our data. And uh, we say that the OLS estimator B2 is uh, statistically consistent, uh, if and only if it converges in probability to this true beta tool. And uh, formally, we can state it using so-called probability limit operator, or PLIM, which is on this, on this, uh, on this slide. So we say that, uh, that this estimator is uh, statistically consistent if the absolute value of the difference between uh, B2 and beta 2 approaches to zero, when, uh, when the sample size approaches to infinity. So this is the meaning of this PLIM operator. We can also, also then express it uh, in other way as this using this usual probability. So there is this probability operator in the middle, which states that probability that uh, the absolute value of the difference between B2 and beta 2 is greater than some constant lambda, where lambda is just some, some arbitrary positive number that is uh, greater than zero and that this probability goes to zero as, as the sample size n approaches to infinity. So in that sense, we can think of it the limiting value of the, of the probability of, uh, of something happening. Okay, so this might sound, um, sound a little bit, uh, little bit uh, technical. So let me try to, try to give you an intuit intuitive uh, illustration of what the consistency would mean. So, like in the previous lesson, I, I consider then some probability density functions of, uh, of some estimator. And I took this illustration from the just a Wikipedia article of the, where it illustrates a consistent estimator. So now we are actually looking at the probability density of the same estimator. So this, uh, these different densities, uh, density curves with the blue, red, or, or green colors, they, they refer to the same estimator. However, the estimator is calculated with a different sample size. So the smallest sample size is in the case of, uh, of the blue diagram. And then, then that, that probably case, in case we have just a single observation, we can still calculate the, something with a single observation. Then we have two observations, three observations, four observations, and so on. So in this case, the, the estimator would be would be biased in a finite sample, but uh, as the sample size increases and eventually approaches to infinity, then it will converge to this uh, value of four in this example. So it's possible that the, that the estimator is systematically biased. In this example, it's, a, it's downward biased in a finite sample, but it's still consistent. So this also, this example illustrates you the difference between a statistical consistency and unbiasedness. So they call that unbiasedness required that the expected value of the estimator is equal to this true parameter of interest, whatever the sample size. This is in this example, not the case. Okay, 
So this would be a biased estimator, but it is still consistent. So, so suppose that the true parameter value is four, and and in this case the the estimator is converging. So it is uh, as the sample size approaches to infinity, we get more and more precise estimates, and and they they are get very much concentrated around this uh, value of four. And and we can come arbitrarily close to this value of four by just increasing the sample size. So this is the meaning of uh, consistency in the in the statistical sense. So uh, I do not formally prove the consistency, but I, I make a little sketch of the of the proof and, and I discuss what is it based on. So we can approach the proof also from the same same result that we already showed earlier that we can write this uh, uh, OLS estimator of the slope coefficient B2 as uh, the sum of beta2 and, and, and certain error components. So here it is important that this distinction between this uh, or this link to this uh, uh, sample covariance of X and epsilon becomes very clear. So now if we ap apply this uh, probability limit operator to, to, to B2, so obviously this constant beta2 doesn't really converge anyway, it is just a constant. But then, then the question is that uh, where does this uh, sample covariance between X and Epsilon converge to? That's, that's the critical part. And uh, if this assumption of no autocorrelation holds, uh, in fact, that's a little bit stronger than needed. So autocorrelation, certain type of autocorrelation could be still, still used, but, uh, but, uh, but, uh, but some specific autocorrelation could also kill this result. So it's enough if you have a, a exogeneity condition and no autocorrelation, then uh, the sample covariance of X and Epsilon converges to the population covariance of X and Epsilon as the sample size approaches to infinity. So again, I say, say that this uh, no autocorrelation assumption is just to, uh, used to eliminate some kind of pathological cases. So some some type of autocorrelation is also not necessarily a problem to for the sake for the consistency. So if that is the case and this exogeneity condition also holds, then then this covariance of x and epsilon is actually equal to zero. If exogeneity assumption holds, so the probability limit of b two is equal to beta two. So that's basically the the sketch for the proving proof of consistency. So then I also also mentioned the, uh, the other asymptotic property, namely asymptotic normality. And uh, I want to say that this is a little bit weaker form of, uh, of uh, uh, so-called so convergence in distribution. And this is particularly useful uh, in the next theme when we start to do some statistical inferences. So it is possible to show that if these three assumptions that we have discussed earlier, so the zero conditional mean or otherwise uh, exogeneity, uh, homoscedasticity and no autocorrelation hold, then, then, uh, um, then our, here is the typo, we, we would have B2, not B1. So B2 would converge in distribution to the, to the normal distribution. So in the equation, it's correctly stated. In the text, it's B, B1, but it should be B2. Um, so this, our slope B2, uh, converges uh, in terms of distribution to the normal distribution with the mean of beta 2 and the variance of sigma squared divided by n minus 1 times variance of x. So I'm not going to prove again this asymptotic normality result, uh, but uh, uh, I just want to highlight a couple of things about this. So Notice that uh, that uh, this uh, this also also builds on this, uh, in some sense, the uh, expected value of uh, of uh, of beta two. Uh, of course, if if uh, if exogeneity holds, then then already we know that b two has the expected value of beta two. That's already the unbiasedness imply that. So what this what this result adds on top of that, we know that the distribution of this. Uh, of this, our estimator is normal distribution, and we also know that uh, that uh, we have also know, know that this uh, specific uh, 
variance holes. In fact, we already developed this variance uh, result uh, when we discussed about efficiency in the previous lesson. So we know what is the expected value of the estimator, we know what is its variance, and we know that the distribution is asymptotically normal. So whenever there is like large enough sample size, we know that this uh, estimator B2 should be normally distributed. Okay. And here is one important uh, uh, issue that I want to clarify. So, so developing this result is asymptotic normality. We no way we do not need to require that uh, this error term epsilon is normally distributed. So normally, when when we when we do some kind of uh, statistical testing or or we want to have confidence intervals for our OLS, uh, we are interested in normality of this. Uh, our estimator for the slope coefficient. So we are interested in normality of this B2, but it doesn't need to require that, uh, that epsilon has normal distribution. And uh, in my impression, this is often causing some confusion that, uh, that uh, even, if, uh, even if epsilon is not normally distributed, uh, as the sample size approaches to infinity or when we have large enough sample size, we can behave as if uh, it was normally distributed. It doesn't have to, epsilon doesn't need to converge to normal distribution in any way. What we are interested in is the normality of this, our estimator for the slope coefficients and, and perhaps the intercept coefficients. So this is why we can rely on this asymptotic normality when we do, for example, some statistical tests. So now I'm ready to summarize what we have found in this, this theme so far. So all of this analysis makes the basic assumption that our model is correctly specified. So we, we start from this theoretical model and we have utilized this uh, theoretical model in all our derivations. So of course, if model is wrongly specified, uh, then none of these uh, statistical properties need to apply. Uh, then we had this kind of data requirement that, uh, that uh, we need to have some variation in our explanatory variable. And also, in order to use uh, probability theory, we need to have our empirical uh, data uh, drawn by random sampling, in, in either intentionally or unintentionally. So we need to think about our ob observed sample as a random sample drawn from some population. But particularly, I want to highlight with red color here this kind of uh, three assumptions that actually co concern explicitly about this uh, random error term epsilon, also known as the disturbance term. And uh, particularly important one is uh, when we are interested in the slope coefficient is that uh, our error term should not correlate with the, with the exponatory variable x. And in multiple regression cases, the same is true that our, our uh, regressors x should not correlate with the, with the error term epsilon. So that's, that's maybe the most important assumption if, if you want to memorize from the from this uh, lesson or main lesson from this examination of the theoretical properties is that uh, that uh, in no way this uh, this uh, explanatory variables should correlate with the with the error term epsilon we will later look into in more detail these assumptions of uh, no autocorrelation and homoscedasticity but most uh, most serious one is this uh, exogeneity condition. And uh, I remind again that this exogeneity follows from the zero conditional mean assumption, but, uh, but in some sense, the zero conditional mean is more, um, more extensive than even required for the, particularly for the slope coefficient. And also I want to, want to highlight again that uh, this uh, normality of the error term epsilon doesn't really play any, any role in this, uh, these, any of these properties. So I complete with this kind of uh, little table to compare. So I have here then taking these uh, um, properties that we have considered. I left out this mean squared error because it doesn't doesn't necessarily uh, require any any specific uh, assumptions. You could do it in simulations, for example, even if uh, even if the model is uh, um, wrongly specified or something. So. Uh, if we consider the four other properties that we have considered, 
and and link okay which particular assumptions we we needed to prove those properties so for unbiasedness it was important to have only exogeneity and actually also for consistency exogeneity is uh, main, mainly needed uh, no autocorrelation was also used to give, uh, rule out some pathological examples but particularly no autocorrelation and homoscedasticity would be important for efficiency and asymptotic normality so already with the exogeneity assumption we can we can at least have an unbiased and uh, and most cases also consistent estimator and then additional assumptions are required for for efficiency and asymptotic normality and uh, later on when we will when we will consider uh, possible violations of these assumptions then this table is also useful to to understand that okay what happens then if uh, exogeneity is violated or if uh, if we have autocorrelation or if we have heteroscedasticity then then uh, what happens to our OLS estimator and how we might then improve it to deal with those kind of violations so this is in my view why it is important to uh, consider both the properties and assumptions sort of hand in hand and this is also the reason why I paid so much attention to the properties because it also helps to clarify the role of the assumption so we don't need to take those assumptions by faith we need to understand that okay under what kind of assumptions the classic OLS estimator works and in what kind of situation we need something something uh, some, something improved all right so in the next topic then we will utilize this uh, particularly the property of asymptotic normality to do some inferences and by inferences I particularly refer to to statistical hypothesis testing and uh, also confidence intervals so see you in the next uh, theme then bye bye